All right, and Christine oh, Pip has joined, if you wouldn't mind giving her permission. Yeah, thank you. Get started, no problem. All right, um, we are going to uh, first talk about any adjustments to the agenda. Annie, can you take us through that? Uh, we do not need an executive session. This week. Wonderful, thank you. All right. Moving next to a public comment. I don't see members of the public here, but let's uh, put it out there. Um, would any members of the public be willing, wanting to make a public comment? Go ahead and raise your digital hand if you do. Okay, seeing none, let's move forward into presentation and discussion items. Um, item 4A is the fiscal year 25 budget update and timeline. And for that, we have Annie and Chris. Yes, yeah, so Chris and I will take folks through the budget overview and presentation. It is linked into the agenda. Does everyone have access to it? It's easier for me to do this. Way. Perfect. So as we do all the time, we start with our vision and theory of action, our strategic priorities, because our goal is, of course, that our resource allocation strategy reflects those things that we say are important to us. Our strategic investments in FY25, this list is not meant to be exhaustive, but just some high level changes. We've moved business management services from one to two days per week as a contracted service out of house to full time in house to assist with management of capital projects. As folks know, we have fields, we are exploring deep energy retrofit, we have building renovations. We're looking at a playground renovation and as well as provide additional fiscal and operational capacity. We have increased our educational support professionals as stipulated in individual education plans and in programmatic needs by 2.0 uh, full-time equivalents, so two positions since the FY24 budget that was presented to you folks in the spring. Um, we did and Chris will talk a bit more about this when we go through changes to function subtotals. But we had a position, uh, OT position, as a contracted service. So it's not a district employee, it's a contracted service. That's not a new position. We had typically paid for that using circuit breaker funds. The good news, and this is a huge shout out to Celia Snow, is our out of district placements have dropped precipitously. Downside to that, though, is you get far less circuit breaker funding. This expense, it would not have changed anything for the town or anything else. Um, this expense was not, we didn't have it listed in the budget. Well, it should have been listed in the budget. We had it. We were paying this contract on using circuit breaker funds. Circuit breaker funds uh, would not, they're diminishing. And so, therefore, it does have an impact. One, you're seeing an increase to total budget. This is contracted services in there, although it's not new, and it doesn't have an it does have an impact on our increases to local contribution. We are investing in the recruitment and the retention of experienced and highly qualified personnel. Sometimes what that looks like is this committee is always evaluating regionally competitive wages for each class of employee. There are sometimes that adjustments to wages occur after the passing of the budget. So perhaps what was passed in FY24, an adjustment was made in the summer or some other way. And so the comparison of wages, you're really comparing to what was presented in FY24, although the adjustment may have occurred in FY24, but it didn't show up in the original budget document last year. And we have replaced staff um, who have retired or left with very experienced and highly qualified personnel. Um, and we've adjusted our school transportation expenditures to reflect inflation, as you know, we haven't been up to date in five years. Chris is now going to walk us through, um, and these are explained. You can see changes from FY24 to FY25 in our function subtotals. Um, and then a brief explanation that Chris will take us through along with some additional um, information about finances options, what is an expenses. Okay, so basically, <clears throat> excuse me, we have all of the budgets um, function subtotals listed here. Um, what I'll touch on really are just the ones that 
that changed by more than 5% rather than going through each and every line, if that's okay. Um, so the first one, General Administration School Committee, um, a lot of these items <clears throat> really just got tweaked a little bit. Um, a, a lot of the items such as MASC dues um, had not increased at the rate that we thought they would. Um, and so therefore, I could reduce that amount in the budget and still feel comfortable having um, you know the amount that we changed it to being sufficient enough. And a lot of these items, you know, if you look at it, you know, the change in that line is only seven hundred dollars. So it's not huge, but because it's such a small um, category, it shows up as a pretty big expense. Um, so that's that's why you see such a big expense change there. Um, finance and business is the next one that basically added my salary in. It also added about twenty two thousand dollars of cost. Um, the, the town is upgrading their payroll system. And they asked the school if we could cover the school portion of that cost. Um, so there's an additional $22,000 in that line. Um, so that, that increased it a little more. Um, we can jump down to district-wide academic leadership. Um, that is 9% of an increase and it's largely the result of two items. Uh, number one was that we had increased the secretarial salaries um, at the end of last fiscal year to bring them up to basically the um, the average in the area. And unfortunately, that was not budgeted for last year. So when we compare this year to last year, it kind of gets a double whammy because we're comparing it to before we increased it at the end of last year, and then we built upon that increase for this year. So it's showing a larger amount. And then the uh, contracted services for special education that were covered by um, circuit breaker in the past are now included in the budget as we won't have enough circuit breaker funds uh, to cover that going forward. A uh, little bit further down substitutes. Um, we didn't budget really any more days for the substitutes, but the substitute rate was increased at the end or last year. Um, basically because it was hard to get subs at what we are currently paying them. And it brought us up to the, again, the average in the area. Um, so that accounts for the 12 and a half percent increase there. Um, power salaries, <laughs> excuse me, um, increased by 8.79%. Uh, we added a couple of paras that were uh, needed in the special education area. And so that uh, accounts for the increase in that particular line. Uh, professional development decreased by 15%. Again, um, some of these items were left alone, such as uh, the contractual obligation. We kept that line item in just because it's important to have what we are obligated to cover in the budget uh, just in case. But some of the other areas that we had in the past few years covered um, through the budget are now going to be handled in district. So uh, it wasn't necessary to have as high of an amount in that particular area, and we decreased it accordingly. Um, it was kind of a similar thing with textbooks, <clears throat> where uh, we had textbooks budgeted last year to be replaced. This year, we have some textbooks that will be replaced, um, but a lot of them will be grant funded. And, um, and again, we're having less textbooks um, replaced this year than we did last year, so we were able to decrease uh, the amount of that uh, um, line. Um, other instructional services. So this is the one that Ann had mentioned, um, a $73,000 increase. That is largely, again, the uh, special ed contracted service that we had paid from Circuit Breaker before now is in the regular budget to, to be covered here. Uh, a little further on the next page, psychological services. Um, so we have the same number of people in this area but uh, we had a person leave and another more experienced person came in and took their place. So that accounts for the larger increase there. Uh, transportation is a little bit of a wild card. Actually, the ad was posted today to go out to bid for transportation. And it also appeared on the state's goods and services page. So we are beginning the process of uh, going out to bid for transportation. I built in an increase in the regular ed transportation of 30%, uh, just to cover us just in case, um, you know, the, the existing contract is five years old. So 
I'm assuming a pretty good size increase there. Um, and it, it was, you know, it's not showing a 30% increase because other items in this area did not increase by 30%. Uh, we had some decreases in the special ed transportation just due to the number of out of district students that we have. So we were able to decrease the budget in that area and it kind of kept the overall percentage down a little bit. Um, custodial services. So we hired a couple of new custodians during the year last year. Uh, they were brought in at higher salaries than those that had left. So again, that accounts for um, the majority of the increase in that particular area. Uh, utility services is the next one over 5%. Uh, let's see, electricity, water, sewer. We looked at all of these for the past three years, the cost that we had experienced. And um, going forward, I accounted for a slight increase because our kilowatt hour rate increased um, at the beginning of this year. But as, um, as you can see, um, it's still down 8.74%, even with that little increase, just because of the usage that has gone down. So uh, we were able to reduce those lines a little bit. Maintenance of grounds. We had uh, contracted services to pay for the mowing of Hadley Elementary School. We've been handling that in-house. So that accounts for the, uh, the $8,000 decrease there. Uh, maintenance of equipment. Again, I mean, you know, some of these, it's, it's really kind of tough. It's a $500 decrease. Um, it shows up as, as a large percentage, but it's $500, again, based on what we've spent in the past. So uh, you know, that that accounts for the decrease there. And then we had a couple of special ed decreases, one in the payment to Massachusetts schools. We had a couple of students that are aging out in that area. And we have one in payment to non-public schools, again, aging out. Um, or I think that one actually moved away, but either way, um, they won't be our student next year. So we were able to eliminate that from the budget. And that is basically all of the items that were either plus or minus 5% or more. Uh, I can certainly answer any questions on individual lines you might have. Thank you, Chris. Um, any questions for Chris about any of these individual increases or decreases? Still your show, brother. Revenue comparison. There are no questions. Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm jumping from screen to there we go. Okay, thank you. All right, so we'll go to the revenue comparison okay. next. <clears throat> Excuse I me, this to... just compares. Oh, I I'm do sorry, have a question. Yep. Yes. Um. So I know you took that one student out, as well as the you know the payments to math school special ed. So what happens if we have a student who comes into the district? How are we going to, I mean, are we not, is there any, do you see what I mean? Is there anything that, that. In other words, there? if there, if there's a new student who needs special. Right. Education, now that's not, the that? money's not in the budget for that. That is correct. The, the money is correct. not in the budget. Um, It depends. If a student comes into the district after April 1st, uh, that student is the responsibility of the sending district as long as it's they're being sent to a public school. Um, if it's a private school, that does not come into play. Um, so no, we we don't have any uh, extra funds budgeted in case a student moves in. Um, we'd have to make that up. Historically, we've tapped school choice, I believe, to make up that shortfall. Correct. And, and, and can I just I think what you meant to say, Chris, is that they if. If the April 1st rule applies to private school placements, not public school placements. I did get that backwards. Yes, my yeah. apologies. Yep. Yeah. So private school placements, not public school placements. And yes, it's been. Okay. So it just... could happen. And it's always been a wild card, but we've, uh, we've been blessed with a school choice account that has been healthy and has <laughs> provided us the buffer to be able to make that up. And then, um, once a new student is in and we've accounted for it by way of school choice, we've uh, put it in the budget into subsequent years to uh, to build that back in. Great question. Okay, any others before I move on to revenue? Okay. So next up, we have the revenue comparison. It's basically showing how we're going to pay for the budget. And if you compare FY24 to 25, 
you can see we have that increase in local contribution of 3.75%. Uh, then we have just really not a lot of change, but some movement in the grant funds that we are using to help cover the budget. Um, the ESSER funding is ending uh, on September 30th of uh, 2024. So all the money has to be spent by then. Um, so we don't have any available for FY25. Some of the items are staying the same, but we are utilizing a couple of grants, the 117 grant student opportunity and the 460 early college to offset some salaries that are helping to keep the budget down. Um, we're using a little more school choice this year than we did last year and also more pre-K revolving. Um, we are taking in more pre-K uh, pre funds for um, the students that attend and we have more funds available to be able to use to offset the budget again. So. If you compare this year to last year, you can see we've we've increased by about thirty four thousand dollars from last year to this year in the grant funds that we're using. Um, really, not a big amount, um, a little over two percent of an increase. Um, and you can see at the bottom the total revenues show a, an increase of three and a half percent, which is the same as what the budget um, was increased by. And I don't remember, Anne, if I talk about the, the next item underneath that, or is that yours? No, it's all you until the groovy charts. You finish out the page. Man. Can I ask a question about revenue? Absolutely. First of all, so nice to see non-local revenues. A, a lot of the grant funding that you've applied for, Annie, paying off with, uh, with revenue there. Thank you for that. Um, keep up the great work in applying. Um, I have a question about after school revenue. Is that something that's historically shown up in the revenue comparison and we're not seeing it here or is it accounted for differently? It's it's um, accounted for differently. The after school program is similar to the lunch program and in, in that it's self-supporting. Okay. Right. So we don't have either one included in our budget. We wouldn't show the expenses or the revenues. Right, I, I, I think what tripped me up was seeing the pre-K here and why it's here and not there. You know, I sort of think of this, them the same ancillary programs, if you will, but got got it. It's it's it shows up differently. Yep. Yeah, and I if I could add to that, Chris. So technically, although if you're thinking historically in the lunch account, you would say no, Mackenzie, that's not even close to being correct. But now that lunches are actually the state does provide lunch for every child, they operate Hadley Kids and the food services account like a true enterprise fund, meaning they're designed to be self sustaining through fees. Pre-K is not self-sustaining. In the absence of support from the operating budget, it's it's not going to happen. Mm, it's good not fee-dependent. And so we we wouldn't, correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, we wouldn't include enterprise fund revenues as a source of funding for the operating budget um, because it's, it's for Got That's it. That's correct, yes. Very good. Thank you. Please continue, Chris. All right, so the next portion, uh, it basically just shows um, the total budget and the, the historical increases that we've had over the past few years. Um, as you can see, we've really worked very hard to try to keep those increases down. Also um, to the right side, you can see the local portion of the budget. And again, how we've uh, tried to keep them down and also the amount of money that's been returned to the town each of the years. So. You know, as you can see, like in, in FY21, we returned uh, a considerable amount back to the town, but we have tried in the past couple of years to have something left in the budget uh, that would help the town as well. Obviously, we don't know how FY24 is looking yet, and and, and FY25, we certainly can't predict, uh, you know, a certain amount going back to the town, but, you know, if there's something, um, it will be returned. If there's not, then, then it won't, but, um, I mean, it is nice to see at least a few years of of returning funds to the town. We assume that that's helped the overall town budget. Great, and I can pick up from there if there are questions for that. I just will, I always have to ask. So obviously those increases were the budgeting increase and clearly don't take into consideration. If you take into consideration the money returned to the town, the local in some cases is actually decrease. That is correct, yes. And so then just so the remaining, I'll go through this quickly. It's not financial, but it's just kind of context of where are we at. And there's some good news in here. Um, so first of all, our enrollment data, trends and projections. 
you can see from, this is total enrollment, right? So this isn't foundation. So this doesn't drive chapter 70. This uh, drives, these are uh, students uh, in seats. And um, this is the October 1 count. It's actually gone up a bit since October 1. So our October 1 count, we did see an increase from FY23 to FY24. And that's good because it had been more or less kind of turning downward there. So nice to see that increase. Um, and uh, you can see that graphically as well. Foundation enrollment, which is what you see uh, the chart on page seven. Uh, foundation enrollment, now why is this really important? Fortunately, foundation enrollment continues to trend backwards. So actual enrollment, it's just sitting in the seats in consideration school choice. Um, foundation enrollment includes all the students for whom the town is fiscally responsible for their education. That is your foundation enrollment. And you see that that has trended downward and that is what drives chapter 70 aid to the towns. Um, and so that we are in what's called hold harmless. Actually, this town should have seen pretty significantly decreasing revenues in the form of chapter 70 aid but there is what's called a hold harmless provision that is pretty much just kept that stable for the town. There's also information here, data about uh, kind of race, ethnicity, and selected populations. And um, you can see, particularly if you go to page eight, the next page, and you look at uh, district enrollment by race, ethnicity, and selected populations, you can see that um, between last year and this year, a little bit more diverse in terms of student population. Um, we have seen, well, well, we've seen a lot of our selected populations between last year and this year holding steady. We have seen um, significant increases if you look back, like a five-year look back, right? Five or six-year look back where you see increases in students qualifying as high needs of about 10%. Uh, similarly, our low income population, about 9% greater than it was in fiscal year. Those populations have grown, although relatively stable from last year. If you go to page nine, you can see some information on school choice. Uh, thank goodness, we really want to say thank you to every single family who chooses Happy Public Schools. It means the world to us. I'm glad that we could offer some additional things this year, like bus stops for school choice families and encourage more people to consider Hadley as an option. See now that our choice in is really turning in the right direction. We had a slight uptick, although it's been relatively stable in choice out, which we certainly want to see that um, to try to contain that expense for the town. And you can see the breakdown of revenues and expenses. The FY24 is projected. We won't have actual until end of fiscal year. School choice is billed and um, we receive the revenues to actual FTE. So it starts the day a student comes in. It's why in many of these charts, I just round to head count, but really we get paid like it could be 110.4 kids. Depends on the day they walk in the door. We have two virtual school options or students do. And um, you can see, which I think the school committee took this into consideration um, when I have presented a policy option of like, what do we see in virtual schools? You can see that the participation in virtual schools has declined markedly um, since fiscal year 20, where our virtual school tuitions were just above 48,000 and now they're just above 10. And then this, and I apologize for the blur, it's when you know I put something from Word into Google Box. But I always, we always like to look at where are students going and where are they coming from and what's happening? We're seeing changes to that. It also helps us try to think about what kinds of programs or opportunities might be more interesting to our students and more attractive. So you can see again, it is great news. Our overall school choice at 124 students choosing in, 47 students who um, are residents of Hadley choosing other public school districts. We did notice something this year. I mean, from FY23 to FY24, we saw a pretty big uptick in families from Amherst choosing Hadley public schools from 14 choices in last year to 24 at this point this year. 
um, and we're still accepting school choice students. Uh, and we have, and I think I mentioned here that we, so we have um, students uh, coming in from about 21 districts and going out to, I have the numbers, um, going out to far fewer. Now I can't find it, it's written in the narrative. Um, and also I break it down for you by grade and by school. Helpful to us, right? So we pay attention where it's like, wait a minute, why did that tell more increase? And we sit around as a leadership team and with teachers and say, what happened between this grade and this grade? Like if the cohort has stayed stable, why do we see an uptick in kids? What might we attribute that to? We do do exit interviews. For the most part, families usually just talk about programming, different children, you know, larger schools. Usually and frequently, kids are coming to us or looking for a smaller school, right? Um, but we pay attention to changes grade to grade to, to try to dig deeper into that and say, what might this mean and what might be happening? Um, and uh, HES right now, it's fantastic. They have over five times the number of students attending through school choice and exiting through school choice. Hopkins has about five times more students entering through school choice and exiting through school choice. Um, so that's good. And also, always, I am very proud of this. I didn't do my little tiny, unimpressive bar graph, but uh, students with disabilities, families who have children with disabilities, choice in for every two students who choice in for another district, only one parent of a student with disabilities, a resident student, choices. Me, I say this all the time, but I would like to be thought of as a destination district for families of children with disabilities. So that's one. Um, uh, indicator that I track very closely. People, I always like to correct the misthinking that, oh, you certainly don't want that because it's more expensive. It's important to remember that school choice is a flat uh, reimbursement of $5,000, but we are reimbursed what's called special education increment for all special education services for a student on an IEP. They're, the town of residence is fiscally responsible for that student. Similarly, student on an IEP leaves Hadley and goes to another school, we are fiscally responsible, um, which is why you can't just times 124 times 5,000. We do that for budgeting purposes, but why you see that revenue is maybe higher, like move that to the end by five, I get far lower, because that special education increment that we also receive for students with IEPs. Charter school enrollment, well, the good news and, is, sorry. Is that a flat in increment? Increase special ed, or is it a? Uh, it doesn't vary based on what the need is. Exactly. So it's build the actual and it's personal to that IEP. I see. So it's right. build the actual and personal to that IEP. So unlike, uh, it's a great question, Himera. When we think about our vocational school tuitions, it's actually usually frequently there's like a special education surcharge. It's not built to actual. It's built to actual. What is in the IEP? At the end of the year, Celia has to go through and say. I'm demonstrating all the services and the cost of every service um, for a school choice student as well. So charter school enrollment, good news, bad news. So the good news is that um, enrollments have decreased. I mean, not by a ton, but we take everything that we can get, right? So we have seen a decrease in charter school enrollment. That is extremely hard when you have a charter school right in your backyard, super hard. Um, but charter school tuitions have gone up. So a decrease in enrollment, but an increase in what charter schools are anticipated to cost. Yeah. Christine, there, did you have a question? Yeah. I'm just curious about um, how exactly the charter schools uh, come up with their enrollment costs and does the state have any input? Does the, is there any kind of, so I, I guess I'm just wondering, you know, if they increase by, you know, a ridiculous amount or percentage, do we have any way of saying no to okay. how much we pay? The short answer to that is no. So how the charter school formula works is um, what they do is they determine what, they use the same foundation enrollment that the state uses. And um, so it's, it's not just a flat fee. If you look at charter school tuitions, every sending district is paying a different tuition rate to that charter school because it's dictated by 
And at a future school committee meeting, I can pull up my school primers. I better graphs for, for as good as I can screenshot graphs. They're better that explain it. But foundation enrollment that the state says, the state says, this is what we believe it costs to educate a student adequately at this grade level with these characteristics. This is what we think is the foundation for, um, well, actually it's our foundation too, but for district administration, for curriculum and instruction for faculty. So they come up with a foundation a base rate. Um, just like in our own foundation calculation, certain students are, cost more to educate. So a student in a chapter 74 program, or maybe potentially a student, there's there's additional for a student uh, with an IEP potentially. So they look at who are the actual students from Hadley that are going to this particular charter school? What is the foundation rate for that student with those characteristics? And the other thing that happens, everyone hears me talk about this, uh, bugaboo with the charter formula that really hits small schools like ours hard is that the percentage that the town pays above what's required, it's called percentage above foundation, the charter school gets to tap that percentage on to its tuition for that town. So I'm going to give you an example because I remember years ago use Linux as an example, and the charter schools they sent to, to, this was many, many years ago. And they were spending for a particular tuition like $25,000. I thought, goodness gracious, how can that be? Well, Linux today, I don't know what they were then, spends 150% about 150%. So that 150%, whatever the foundation is, gets locked on, tacked on. And then there also is, so that's the formula for doing it. There is no pushback every year. That's how it goes. Um, there is state aid that comes into play. And again, I can bring my charter school like primer back for a quick refresher on charter schools. Um, Cause sometimes it feels, it, it feels counterintuitive. Like the enrollments went down, but we're gonna pay more money. And that seems a little weird. Um, and it's, they do get to, they, those tuitions again are set by foundation. Foundation goes up every year, but there's that percentage above foundation that factors in. Okay. Um, so we're seeing a decline in enrollment of the tuition payments. Chapter 70 enrollment, which starts on page 14, and this could be attributed to a whole host of things, but this is an active area that we're trying to pursue, right? To provide opportunities for students at Hopkins that feel relevant, that feel career connected, um, that, yeah. So we've seen at, in FY19, we have 35 students in chapter 74 programs, whether that was Smith Oak or Franklin Tech. And we are projecting 13 at this point in FY20. Uh, those tuitions in FY19 were 600, uh, almost $629,000. And we're projecting those in FY25 to be closer to 268,000. We are assuming what the increase might be. Those rates have not been published. Vogue schools do not follow that complicated formula. I just explained to charter schools. Vogue schools have a flat tuition. They increase it by percentage increases. And Christine, you may have been thinking for private special education schools, private schools that, that serve students with disabilities. Those rate increases are subject to approval by the Operational Services Division. And schools can say, whoa, flag on the field. It can, it doesn't mean it's heard, but that is not an option with charter tuitions, different laws. The good news in all of this on page 15 is for the last two years, and I always point out how hard this is to do, we only have one way to bring kids in, it's through school choice. We have multiple ways for kids to leave. They can choice out, they can go to uh, a chapter 74 program, they can go to a charter school. There are more charter school options beginning in seventh grade than there are in the elementary grade. So having said that for the past two years, public choice in has exceeded choice out exits, even though there are more pathways to leave. This is wonderful, wonderful news. I want to say that I attribute this entirely to, first of all, our beautiful students, because when they do shadow days, our kids are so nice. I'm gonna tell you about that in the, in the superintendent report, like, like crazy nice. 
Um, but our teachers, right, student shadow, we have these lovely qualified faculty um, and our administrators who are just hitting the ball out of the park. Not me, I'm not talking about me, I'm talking to your building principals, your support staff that are just doing a bang up job. And from, from A to Z, try to make it a welcoming experience. Um, so although this says 124, because I use the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education numbers, they take a sn snapshot in time to get school choice numbers. I can tell you that it's actually higher than that now, up to 131 in actual real time school grades. Um, so it just keeps going up. We just took in a new school choice uh, student last week. Um, and then our revenue trends. So uh, we are incredibly grateful to the town. This out that there's required and there's uh, extra local. And so what the town is required to spend and the additional money that the town provides for the schools. And we are keenly aware of the fact that the town um, does not say to the schools, you're getting minimum and live with it. The town has been extremely supportive to us. We know that it's um, why we also include that chart, we're not trying to pat ourselves on the back, but we're trying to stay with the chart that says we really are always working to present responsible and modest increases. So we're keenly aware of the town's generosity. Um, and so um, we pay attention to that. Although it is important to note on page 17, that while the town is extremely generous and extremely grateful, that uh, since fiscal year 18, these percentages on page 17, look at the school, school department expenditures and you get this from the division of local services. And so FY23 is the most recent data. We're not done with FY24 yet. Division of local services says what each expenditure category is as a percentage of the total operating budget for the town. So in FY18, the schools are about 44%. Um, in FY23, they're down to 37%. Um, so while the town is extremely generous, the town also is, you know, schools are not, and you can look at this comparison in the next graph, they're not absorbing, um, you know, over half of the town budget. Whereas if you look at many other towns in Hampshire County, uh, Amherst, Belchertown, Hatfield, um, over 50%, um, Granby and South Hadley, a little closer to 48 per, uh, to 50%, this graph is FY22 because two of those towns had not submitted their FY23 data to Division of Local Services. So to get as many towns as possible, um, Hatfield and East Hampton, if there were FY23, would read zero because they haven't submitted the data to that. Oops, um, so town is extremely generous and hopefully the town sees the schools as not trying to hoover up every single resource and um, Walking away saying thanks and then can we have some more? And then per pupil expenditures, again, this is something that's posted to the DESI website, DART, which stands for something, District Allocation Resource Tool, that's what that stands for. And so you can see where um, we stack up in terms of pure, per pupil expenditure, Belchertown. Um, now, of course, some of this is because there are so many more students, right? So the expenditures are distributed over a much larger student body. Belcher Town, I'm gonna to guess, is probably closer to 1,800 students. Um, Amherst, of course, is a much larger district, um, but um, yeah, so you see where we stack up. Uh, and then, you know, I'll address, and Chris and I can kind of quickly address the elephant in the room of like, wow, we've had that increases for the past few years that have been, you know, under 3%, and now this one, Right now, it looks like it could be 3.75. We are very, very early in the game. So the timeline, which you have access to in February, and I'm sure later when people are giving out reports, uh, Joyce will even have more information about this. But in February, Chris and I will go before the Finance Committee, FinCom in town, um, talk with them. We ultimately, the select board and, the, and FinCom will give provide us feedback Perhaps they'll be required to provide us some parameters given the priorities that the town has, given their revenue picture. Um, and Chris and I will continue to monitor where we can, um, what adjustments we can make and as things change. So always in January, it's early times. 
what Carolyn, the town administrator, asked for in early January is please give us your department's numbers for a level services budget. To maintain level services, what would you need? Um, this is our snapshot in January. These things are subject to change. And we are always, always, always working to make sure that we are as responsive and responsible as we can be to a town that is very generous and kind to us. Certainly, if you have any questions, Chris or I could answer them. Thank you, Annie and Chris. Um, and thank you for taking us through um, the detail. Uh, I feel well informed and um, and I'm, I'm glad we're on time with these uh, the, the town's request. Um, any questions for Annie or Chris about this? Now, Annie, um, you don't need us to vote on this. We, we need to present it to the town, arrive at a final number, and that vote takes place somewhere closer to... Um, Probably March. So, so by uh, law, so please put on your calendars May 2nd, right? Uh, that is uh, annual town meeting, Thursday, May 2nd. Please come out and support uh, the town, the budget, the school department budget. Uh, we will do, we will advertise in the paper and have the public hearing of the budget, probably at our March meeting. So in that, in that outside chance that we don't get a quorum, that still leaves us for April, right? You have to have a public hearing and that vote is advertised in the paper before the school department budget can go to town meeting for May. But we'll keep updating you after we meet with FinCom or whenever that, we'll come back again in February and we'll keep getting updates. And in March or no later than April, we'll have the advertised in the paper school department budget. That's when we'll need to vote. And then that vote is what we, you know, hopefully that's our budget and hopefully local contribution and that vote line up. Very good choice. Oh, okay. Um, thank you. And I have appreciated the school committee beyond means of what Dr. McKenzie and all of you have done for the town um, and returning any type of money or whatever you've done. Um, I truly appreciate you and all your hard work. Um, we had our first blush of the uh, fin with the finance committee last week. Um, we will continue forward. Many of the things that came up was that we will meet again, or you will meet again with FinCom, uh, Chris and uh, Dr. McKenzie, um, and moving things forward with whatever. And we opened the town meeting warrant. So there, th that is available. If you have anything that needs to go on to the warrant, uh, please send that in to us. I attended the MMA meeting this past weekend, Friday, Saturday. And of course, you know, Governor Healy, Kim Driscoll, they all have their, uh, Lieutenant Governor, um, had their things about monies that are they're asking for to be put into the budget, hopefully for schools and roads and things of that nature. So hopefully there might be something. We don't know uh, what their final outcome will, will be once they present it to the House and the Senate. Um, so again, we always look forward to that to see what comes to us. Um, and we'll just go forward, but always do look forward to working with you. You're such a workable group. I thank you for all that you do. So thank you. Thank you, Joyce. It means a lot. Um, we love working collaboratively with the town and have felt very, very supported. And uh, thank you. Thank you for those kind words. I did have. Oh, you're on mute. Yeah. I did have through my grapevine, I heard that the Chinese charter school has started the process to buy half of the national evaluation systems uh, building up at the North Maple Street uh, campus up there. So I will keep my ear to the ground uh, to see how that goes through, if that goes through. So it looks like they are trying to expand also. So I'm not sure how that will affect us or any other surrounding towns around us, but it looks like they're looking to um, do more with their uh, education program also. So just to, we'll just keep that in the loop and I'll keep you informed. 
Thank you, Joyce. Annie, do you know if um, if there's a limit on their enrollments that they've been putting a cap on it that that our students have applied and not gotten in, or has it been any student who's applied has gotten into the Chinese Charter School? So there is something in the laws for charter schools that does. It, there's a certain point at which a charter school may not be able to accept students from a town. There is a threshold of I think it's percentage of percentage of budget to charter school. So when I bring back that additional that remember, I'm not remembering exactly, but there is a there's a time and, and it can change then if, if if enrollments fluctuate. But I'll make sure I have the specific what that is and when it happens. Um, because it has happened for Hadley. Um, although it doesn't happen a lot, but it has happened for Hadley. Great. Yeah. Thank you for coming back to us with that, Paul. Yeah, on that, I mean, they tried several years ago, they tried twice, right, to expand their enrollment and it somehow, was it DESE was not authorizing it? I don't remember the details. I know they tried once, it didn't work, and then they tried again. Yeah, yeah. So because charters expansions and other things, they're approved through a separate arm of the Department of Ed. Um, I'm not sure there could be a gazillion reasons, right? There could have been something in the charter application that the department said, yeah, this looks good, but we just need this piece tightened up. It could be, you know, that they could have determined some degree of saturation um, in a particular area. I uh, I don't know. And that isn't in my Ruby and little charter primer, but now you have me curious. So perhaps it'll be added. <laughs> yeah. so functional annex. Okay. Thank you yeah. for bringing it up, Joyce. And Annie, if you could, if you could, figure that out and bring back some information yeah. for us to just consider that would be helpful. I would like to ask though, it does seem that we've had a considerable jump of choice uh, in students. Uh, it, it seems like we're at the highest level. Uh, since yeah. it, like in, um, and they may, they may only want the building for uh, more classrooms and not necessarily increasing their, their yeah. student population. Maybe they just want the building. It's only, half of the building that they're looking at, not the whole building uh, where the national evaluation system is. So, you know, splitting that building and still letting a national evaluation system stay there and using the other half over there. So then maybe they're just looking at expanding their programs for the population that they already have. Um, I don't know their semantics or why they're doing it, but that's that's what I've heard is that they're interested in the building itself. Interesting. And, and we are, uh, so our school choice is really, really high. And that's that's wonderful. And of course, um, we're hoping, I also have to bring back to you folks those NESDAQ projections, right? Because we love school choice, it's wonderful. It helps us, as you can see, as our school choice increases, we mm -hmm. apply a greater share to the budget. We recognize that we use those revenues and try to help out the town, but, um, Ultimately, the desire is that we also have greater foundation enrollment. So that's what drives chapter seven. Mm -hmm. right. as it in enrollment. Yeah. yeah. Well, two things. Why why do you think we have such a bump? And then just remind me. So those choice in folks, mm -hmm. I'm just thinking of I know this is not dollar for dollar, but if you, you amortized it per student, the cost was what was it, eighteen thousand dollars per student, roughly. And um, but yet choice in folks are Five thousand dollars from the contributing town. Am I, is it proper to think of those numbers similarly, or is it? Um... Yeah, it really, it really isn't. And here's why. And I've also had some more of like in dribbles and drafts. I won't bore Chris and I will not bore the world with like uh, advanced course in chapter seventy. That's an excellent question. People always think that, and I should have foreseen that, especially with that last slide. So, actually. You know, if if our enrollment is, they look at foundation enrollment and then look at kind of what what's happening in terms of our expenditure. And I do have to double check this. Of course, you can correct me if when they do the per pupil expenditure, if they're using our actual enrollment or if they're using our foundation enrollment to come up with that. I have to double check that. But in the absence, if we didn't have school choice, I mean, think about boom that revenue is just gone. And the presence of those students, so you guys can help me this, oh, you can help me to say this better. So if 
if that school choice student isn't there, even if those 124 students aren't there, because you can see they're distributed across multiple grades, if they're not there, where's the corresponding decrease in expense? We don't right. turn down the heat. We don't probably lay off a teacher. We don't, if a student requires a one-to-one -one or that kind of support, we're getting that through special ed increment. So we're not incurring that cost of not getting it. So that headcount leaves, right? There rarely is a corresponding, if there were 124 students and they were like, boom, they were all in this in middle school. Okay, well, if they go away, then yeah, there's a far fewer people, but they're distributed. So it really is just the game of that revenue. Does that make sense? Well, we have the fixed cost of operating our school the, the, the way it is. And additional money means we're able to spread that over more students. So our, our per pupil expense would be probably somewhere closer to Hatfield's 19K or perhaps even uh, Amherst's 23K uh, if we took away those that school choice dollars, I, I would imagine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have to verify? I don't know, if, Christy, if you knew the answer to that, if you started to say something or maybe we should have to look it up, is that on per pupil expenditure if they use um, the, if they use foundation or if they use um, actual uh, when calculating that for DART, but um, yes. So exactly those fixed costs, you're, 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 yeah, you're, you're still, you still have those fixed costs. Right. Okay. So we are just keeping mindful of the time. Um, I'm going to ask for any last questions or comments about the budget uh, before we move on. Okay, great. Annie and Chris, thank you so much. We're going to uh, uh, look forward to the follow-up discussion uh, later in the following weeks. Uh, moving next to the first reading of the revised BEDH public participation at school committee meetings policy um, and the public speak sign up form. Uh, Ethan and Christine. Thank you all. I'm going to make sure Christine is in on this. Um, mm -hmm. This is uh, the revised uh, version of the public participation form for policy. Uh, something we worked on for a couple of months, made a bunch of kind of small changes along the way, um, being conscious of, and really the big thing that we added is the the form that you guys also have access to. Um, I think we were thinking a lot about the experience at the beginning of the pandemic, and if we ever were to see a big influx of people at our meetings again, um, making sure that everybody had a voice um, and that people could sign up ahead of time. So if they wanted to speak, they could speak. So that way um, they, that if someone really wanted to be able to get in front of the audience uh, of the school committee, they would have the opportunity to sign up ahead of time. Um, and then as whoever was the chair, who Mary, you're currently the chair, you'd have the ability to, as you can see, um, make some changes if necessary a lot it, leading up to a meeting if we had a big influx of students or students of people that wanted to speak. Um, and then also uh, a little bit in terms of the amount of time that's allowed um, for those speakers, depending on the number of speakers that are uh, in the queue. Christine, what did I miss? I think the only other, um, when they sign up, we ask about their residency and, uh, you know, if they're, um, if they're not from town, if they don't have a child within the school system, that way, you know, that uh, they not speak, essentially, that we we reserve the right for our parents uh, and not for people who are looking to create issues. Um, obviously, again, we were just looking at the pandemic as an example of what we want going forward. Just a uh one point of clarification there is that they could still speak, right? So right. one of the reasons about asking about organizational affiliation is nationwide and in Massachusetts, there are folks who feel very strongly about certain things. and They may have no relationship to the school, but they have a relationship to an issue. For example, think of book banning. So this just requires people to kind of state their connection perhaps to a particular group that may be 
uh, using a public meeting of a democratic body to advance a policy agenda, but it just allows kind of knowledge of what somebody's stake in a particular issue on the agenda. And I do want to underscore there's nothing that prevents, although it does allow, it assumes that public speak is, you know, competition with this is limited to a um, three minutes, um, five people, 15 minutes, but the chair, school committee, always has the right to extend that should they choose. Thank you. I think the this guideline and the form is very helpful. Um, I really appreciated reading through um, the, the how we budget for the timing um, and that we keep it to 15 minutes unless there's something um, that warrants extending that. It's nice to get a heads up um, about a given topic that's going to come up. Um, and this is first reading, so we have another month for second reading before we, but a couple of comments that I will share is, um, I noticed that one, there's only one question in the form that is required, um, and which is the email. And I wonder if we would want to have uh, other things required. That's a question that I have, I'm wondering. Another uh, is um, the framing of the last, um, uh, question topic you would like to present. It almost seems like we're inviting a presentation or that, like that's allowed. So maybe reframing to uh, something, the topic that you'd like to comment on or, or something along those lines using the word, you know, co comment. Um, but I, I think this is a terrific um, tool and I look forward to uh, to keep using it. And I just, as you were speaking, I was thinking, okay, so in practice, once this goes into effect, we would be checking the form and that would, that would determine the queue and first come first serve. Uh, and then if there was anyone who just arrived to the call, wishing to make comment, pending time availability, we would call on them next. Yeah. And I think, I think we were just kind of thinking along the lines of if we ever had to go beyond that 15 minutes that we kind of are tied to if we saw enough people in the queue that you and, and the school committee as a whole would know ahead of time like all right we've got 20 people that want to comment then you know let, we're going to have a, you can announce hey we're going to have a little bit more time committed to public comment than we normally would because of the number of the people that signed up right the other thing I would love for us to think about is once this goes into effect, if if this goes into effect, once it goes into effect, how will we get the word out? Is there an expectation on people's parts that they show up for public speak? Or do we, you know, what, what are the ways that we get the word out that there is this new process? I don't have the answer to that, but I'd like you to begin thinking about it. And, and I, I offer to oh, that ahead, pretty yeah. quickly. I was just going to say just very quickly is that nobody can get on these meetings without going to agenda to get the Zoom link. So I think we could at first initially just remind people, if you expect to speak, you of please do the following. Great idea. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. All right. Any other questions about the um, this uh, new proposed policy and the form? Um, I, just said, I, I really appreciate you all putting that together and I appreciate the the narrative rules, I think those are really helpful. I, I must admit, I, just logistically, I, I struggle with the form. Um, I'm fundamentally in public discourse, something like that. If I'm going to request information, Thank I want to make you. sure I, I would do something with it. And I'm not sure what I would do with some of that information about affiliation, uh, town, uh, what they're going to present on. It's not actionable for me if I know that beforehand. They can speak if they get time they can speak regardless of affiliation and town and what they're going to present on. So I, I don't know if we need to request that. And then I also just logistically, if I'm on a call, somebody makes a point, I'm like, oh, I'm going to make a point. And do I, you said Humera, then I just raise my hand and then I get to speak. You raise your, you raise your digital hand and then you're in the queue. If there are, you know, two people so, who filled out the form, they would, they would get priority because they had put in that effort. And then we would go next to whomever had their hand raised. I just worry a form like this is not going to be followed and, and might be more of a headache than, you know, we could we we could take a poll at the beginning of the meeting. Hey, who wants to talk? If you want to talk, raise your hands, we'll put you in a queue now. Um I get it if you're 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 worried that if not worried, but you're you're thinking ahead if we do get an, another long list of, of folks. 
given that we're not getting anybody becoming, it seems like, uh, but it's it's smart to think ahead. But I'm just wondering if there's a, I just worry that if we're going to have a form that folks aren't going to follow, we're going to have to constantly just be reminding them, hey, use the form, got to use the form. Um, so is there yeah. another more efficient way that we just do it at the start of every meeting? I, I could see a scenario where this is the form is a helpful tool for us, but if people showed up and raised their digital hand, we wouldn't turn them away. Um, and I could also see a scenario where uh, this form uh, gets used when there is a really, uh, when there's something like the pandemic and we're preemptively looking ahead. Um, what we are reading about in the in the paper is that other school committees are getting um, deluged by comments from people who are not even from a town. I think it's helpful for us to know that, okay, there's 50 people asking for public comment, 25 of them are from Florida. I think it's just helpful, useful, useful information that gives you an idea of, okay, should we just increase public comment to an hour and a half to account for that? Some school committee meetings go till midnight on the eastern side of the state do we, do we we might want to allow for that if there's an important enough topic but i think by and large we're not going to encounter that uh it'll just help be helpful in management under those extreme circumstances i would imagine and we i think our thinking was also that you know um if there were 10 people and five were from an organization not associated with the school that the parent, you know, we would know that, okay, this is a parent of a child, they, they should be able to speak. Um, you know, maybe a group can get together and appoint one speaker because they're all, if they're all making the same point, but, you know, we don't want parents to feel like they're not being heard because people, you know, with an agenda are taking over our meeting. That's all. Um, and, and, I'll, and I'll make it even simpler. I think I think where it, where it originated from was if we have public comment, we have 15 minutes. Right. So if 10 people want to six people want to comment, that means somebody gets left out. Right. If everybody uses their three minutes. And so if we know there's a t any topic. Right. It could be any topic that comes up that 20 people, 10 people, six people want to speak. Mm -hmm. This gives us the opportunity to sit for whomever, whoever the chair is to say, all right, we need to we need to. Uh, make public comment a little longer and again it, it, on some level it's just kind of a planning thing like all right guys like we're going to have a 30 minute public comment because 10 people signed up for public comment it just gives us a little bit of like foresight moving forward of like hey if we're going to have 100 people that want to do public comment yes to your point Paul I, I I agree with you like some of that data isn't necessarily usable but it also gives us a sense of like what the meeting might look like so that we're not saying, all right, we're going to meet 537 and then we get off at 1130 at night. Yeah, right. that's fair. Those are all good points. Do you see that form being at the beginning, like folks could log on and then sign up? That form would be available on the agenda as soon as the agenda is posted. I mean, it, it's going to be something. And that I think that's one of the things we talked about was that when the agenda is posted, whenever it is posted, that 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 Google sign up would be right next to the to the to the Zoom link when it on the agenda, like so that that it's it's there so that people see it. And again, to your point, like, some people are going to ignore it. That and again, public comment is going to happen regardless. Um, but it does give us an opportunity to say, all right, these people signed up ahead of time. We're going to give them priority at the beginning of public comment, and then you'll also have the opportunity to speak. Yeah, I guess you go to a meeting, you do sign up often. Put your name down in a sign up sheet. And this is, I guess yeah. I hadn't thought about so, this. So if you put, put it down there as, as when I log on, if I didn't know about this, but suddenly somebody makes a comment, I want to respond, I can put my name in the queue through that form. Yeah. And I would just remind you that's exactly before COVID, right? When we met in person, people signed up to speak at a school committee meeting. And when they step up a town meeting floor to speak, they say their name, they say their address. Again, yeah. that has to do with voting. But to yes. your point about this is a public democracy, I think I think these are great questions. It wasn't our goal to like try to stifle this. It was our goal for people to potentially, and again, this hasn't happened here as part of it is like, why worry about it? What you don't want to do is start making rules constraining public comment after public comment has gone out. Right? That's not when you want to do it because then it appears that you may be trying to shut down speech that's just listening to you. Yeah. 
Um, so, so that's some of it too, of like, should people know if someone is actually, what their connection is with the, the taxpayer as a can? Right, jo Joyce, hang on one second. I'll call on you uh, in a moment, but Paul, it, Annie's point, was a really good one about people are going to go anyways to the Google Doc to get the Zoom link to log in, and if it's if there's a visible uh, statement of want to make public comment, sign up here to get in the queue. That could be a very easy way that you you know you're going to come anyways. You you just you know you put your 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 hat you know your your name in the queue uh, that way. But again, I think that this is something that we are sort of intelligently planning ahead in the event that anything like this would be useful to us. If it doesn't work for us, we don't use it. So, and most days, like today when we're, we didn't have anyone coming to comment, uh, it's just gonna be a non-issue. Joyce. Are you okay? Just leave me alone. What? If, it, if you had a really controversial thing come coming up on your agenda and i'm going to use east hampton as a uh, an example so they really had quite a time there where they were zooming and they had um, so many people waiting in the queue to get into the meeting that it just wasn't fair to everybody that wanted to get onto that agenda and be part of that participate in that certain topic. So if you have a certain topic of such source, I'm not sure what would come up um, here in Hadley, but you never know, um, that it would almost behoove you to have an open meeting and have a public forum um, on a certain topic and not have to have it in a Zoom where people wouldn't have that opportunity to speak or you feel like they need to file a application to get onto your meeting if it's that big a deal, if it's that big of a deal, then you really need to have an open forum is, is what I'm thinking, because you wouldn't ever want to set yourself up to the mess that they had over there in East Hampton, because that was a, pardon my language, a shit show. Um, and, and we're not like that in Hadley. We would want to make sure that everybody is heard or whatever and not have to sit there and not have that opportunity to, you know, uh, apply themselves or speak for themselves or whatever might come up. And I mean, that would be my only solution to any big thing, controversial thing. So I don't know. That's a very good suggestion. And I believe uh, during the pandemic, Paul hosted a an open forum. I believe I remember Stacey Wyshynski took notes, really great pro and con notes. And, and there was some really important dialogue that happened there. I think it was on Zoom because we were not in person, but be it on Zoom or in person, a public forum is a great uh, avenue if we ever know we're going to have such a situation. Thank mm -hmm. you for that. Thank you. So I think that, you know, that was actually part of our thinking when we talked about having people sign up, that gives us a heads up of how many people, you know, if you have, if all of a sudden we see there's a long list of people signed up and there's, um, you know, something going on that we need to do or make changes uh, to how we do, how we have our meeting, that gives us enough time to make those decisions because we'll have, you know, we'll already know that there's an awful lot of discussion that needs to be had um, because people have actually signed up to talk. I think that was part of our thinking too, was that's how we could almost gauge whether or not, you know, we were going to have um, a large amount of, you know, feedback coming at us. So, And whether we should modify the agenda right. preemptively to, to, uh, to accommodate and, yep. uh, an honor, but make space for that. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. And just one more comment, and it kind of goes to Paul. Your your comment about the 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 Google the Google form and what's being asked. Um, something to note. Um, number three is again, speakers must begin their remarks by stating their name, town, or city of residence and affiliation. From that, it is also. I mean, I don't remember everyone doing that in 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 a lot of the public comment we did. So that is something that's been added as well, and that kind of jives with what we're asking in the Google form. So that's also something to consider as we head toward the second reading as well, because that would be a new 
ask of, of, of the, the people that are doing public comment. Yeah. All right. Well, you've given us a lot to, yes. Sorry. I just, I, I really like the conversation in general. And I, I also like the idea that it is a little bit more formal um, in announcing, you know, a little bit about yourself, where you're from and your affiliation, even if it's not on a form, like you stated it. Um, and I really like the idea. And I just, the only um, decision would be that, um, you know, I think public comment, although probably pretty rare um, for us to see this, you know, unless something more and more outside of COVID um, happens again, um, but making sure that people know that this is, this is, you know, this, this is to help the um, public, right? And not a, a punitive thing. That's my only concern is that if, if we go out announcing this, there's this new public column sign up a form. I don't want people to think that we're trying to, because that's not the intent, right? It's not the intent at all. Um, but just maybe preemptively letting them know that this is so we can ensure that your voices are heard. We can ensure that we can plan accordingly so that we are hearing you, right? And if we need to take it into another forum, that we, you know, we can do that. But I just, as a parent, just thinking back to some, some people, public comment got a little contentious during COVID. And we just wouldn't want somebody to look at this and go, well, now they're trying to restrict this even more by place. It's, it's not the intent. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, however we put this out, maybe just making sure that it's, it's people, I, I don't know if they're going to read it or not, right? Like, going to read our policy or not, but they're going to read that we have a new thing and you have to sign up for a Google form. And I just want to make sure it's um, received in the light that it was in. A note to our policy team to further think about uh, the framing that we might use in the title of the form, as well as the uh, when it's posted next to the Zoom link in the, in the Google Doc, uh, it could be something more like, we want to hear from you get in the queue by completing the following information. So it's inviting and arms outstretched. I don't know that's the perfect language, but go like think along those lines. So it's less about a request to speak that will be honored or denied and more like a, well, this is the queue. You're just, you're, you're stating your, your interest in, and we're welcoming you. I think that's a helpful reframing. It's a sign up yeah. sheet that you do it. And then also at any public meeting we have, you have to state your name where you live. I mean, that, as I said, the narrative you wrote is great. It was just more of the logistics of the form, but this has been helpful. Great. Thank you. Great. All right. In the interest of keeping us moving, we will come back to that next month. Um, we are turning next to uh, another um, uh, policy item. Uh, actually, I'm not sure if it is. It's, it's actually uh, the revision of the Hopkins Academy Code of Conduct um, per DESE. Annie, do you want to take us through that? So I'm going to take you through, although you'll vote on them separately. Um, the codes of conduct you can vote on together. Uh, C, D, and E. So what is happening here is we have our on-site uh, visit from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education that will happen this Thursday as part of what's called Today's Focus Promise Training. These are visits and audits that occur on essentially six-year cycles, although there's mid-years, so I think every three years that is happening. Um, and what they do is there are a series of requirements and standards against which they audit every district um, to ensure regulatory compliance. Um, what they have said to us, so we upload documents, they take a look at documents, and they say to us, mm, almost but not quite, it actually needs to say this very specific thing. And there really is no discussion here. Uh, so the goal is to try to get as many of these things corrected before the report is published in the spring. Now, after a report is published, there is time for corrective action. There will be things that they tell us we need to correct. Um, but it's nice to get as many of them done before they publish the report. So for example, in C, um, they would like to see um, what we currently have. And you can see what's currently in our discipline. So um, what is unchanged in the code of conduct, uh, text removed is crossed out, text added is highlighted and in bold. So the language from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, what you will see in both C 
And if you were to click on D, because they're related, also revisions to the code of conduct, slightly different. Um, this really is underscoring, there's, there's been a slight change to one of the discipline laws. This comes up frequently. I know when parents ask us questions about it, don't understand why a student can't just be told to spend it, get rid of them, get them out of here. Actually, the law is very clear that you must employ alternative remedies and document said remedies prior to excluding a child from school for disciplinary purposes. And the only time that you don't have to put those remedies in place is, and it's really key, students continued presence in school would pose a specific, you have to say exactly what it would be, not something general, documentable concern about the infliction of serious bodily injury, same level of disruption. Very high standard for exclusion, very high. Not a Hadley thing, it's a state thing. To that end, we must have these things in our codes of conduct saying that we adhere to this, which we do. We do restorative justice, PBIS, all these other things. But that's C and D, they are related. And um, asking you to take a look at those and then asking, normally you're right, this would go through several readings, but it's really in our best interest to have these things corrected before a report is written. Um, and uh, finally, in the bullying prevention and intervention plan, the addition of a paragraph that is in your agenda in italics, simply adding that. Um, I have said, I can answer any questions. I've set these out as two separate motions. One as the revisions to the HA code of conduct. The first two are both in the HA code of conduct. And um, then the approval of revisions to the bullying prevention. I'd like to try to treat this as a block, uh, C, D, and E. So any questions about um, the uh, the language, the text, uh, the spirit of revising the code of conduct or the bullying prevention and intervention plan? Okay, hearing none, do I hear a motion to approve uh, the changes to the code of conduct uh, and the revisions to the bullying prevention intervention plan. So moved. Do I hear a second? Second. second? second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I think Ethan got me there, beat me in that one. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you. All right, great. Thank you, Annie, for bringing this to us. And onward to the superintendent report. I'll be quick and happy. Uh, some of these things we talked about really want to highlight Linux uh, asked the Linux superintendent said to me, can we visit Hopkins? We've heard good things and we want to learn some things. So a team from Linux came out and uh, here's what I love. The faculty commented on how welcoming our students and staff were, how well behaved our students were. I'm not surprised by that at all. The lack of cell phones. They did not see a single one, which they were like, wow, what is this place? The hallways are so quiet. Um, and the helpfulness of all the students who did some focus groups for them and they visited classrooms. So thank you, Lennox, for coming. And thank you, Hopkins Academy faculty, staff, and students for hitting the ball out of the park. No wonder school choice numbers are so high. Uh, CPAC, a big thank you to parent Felicia Seymour for her willingness to assist Dr. Snow. The coordination with the Hadley CPAC it is back in full force. It's revitalized. It's great. Um, I haven't seen this level of enthusiasm since our own Tara Ritter was leading the charge there. Uh, I told you about the tiered focus monitoring review. They'll be here on Thursday. Restorative justice training, wonderful. I participated in this for two days last week. Now we have a large cohort of faculty at Hopkins, very large, trained in intensive restorative justice interventions. That means they can facilitate harm repair. They can act as kind of community support people. So this is just fantastic. Uh, our international students from France, looks like the May date is on. So there is a flyer that's linked in the superintendent report. Any families who are interested in um, hosting French students, they're going to co-host this cohort of students uh, with Frontier Regional High School. We will be updating or upgrading our internet web filter, more to be revealed. Sounds super exciting. Now it's really important. And I'll have all kinds of exciting techie things to tell you on on uh, what direction we're going in. And Park and Rec, 
is uh, taking up kind of where we used to have the 5K with Helping Hearts. Park and Rec is doing the Hot Dog 5K. So there's a flyer there on April 7th. Please think about, I mean, they got me a hot dog. I'm just really not going to move. I'll move fast for a hot dog. So maybe they'll get me involved in the whole thing. But <laughs> once I have my hot dog, I will not be running. And that's it for my report. Great. Thank you. Any questions for Annie? All right. Excellent. Thank you very much. Moving on to the business manager report. Chris, are you there? I am. My camera. There we go. Okay. Uh, so I have a lot for you tonight. I apologize, but there's a lot of information. Chris, can I ask you a favor? Is it just me? Can you make sure that your share access on that report is anyone with a link? And people here can refresh it and make it public. I did link it to the you gotta agenda. make the, the access public. Hmm. I was able to access all three. You were, you were. all three, but okay. not what he's about to talk about now. Um, um I was able to access the express report, the revolving yeah. uh, account. He's gonna give you an overview of what's going on with the DER project. Oh, so oh, oh! What you want to oh. do there on that link, Chris? But you want to do I, click I on that know. link, then click yeah. on share. Click yeah. on the link once it's open. Once your document is open, when you're in your document, you want to click on share, and then just go to yeah. the bottom and click on anyone with it. Okay. And then we'll have to refresh after you've done that. What? What is going on? Why, why do you have that on? What are you doing? I've refreshed, but still no access. I've got access to it. You do? Uh... Were others able to access the link? I got it now. Did you refresh your email? I did. Oh, now, now it's here. Yep, great. Thanks so much. Please continue. My apologies. I actually just finished this just before the meeting. <clears throat> we had a number of phone calls today regarding this. So this information is, is pretty new. Um, okay. So first of all, I, I can update you on the DER project. Um, you know, the RFQ went live in December. I had reported that at the last meeting. Um, there was no talk about pricing during the walkthrough. We had a walkthrough on January 4th, um, went through the boiler room around the school, uh, showed them the locker rooms, the gym, uh, cafeteria, because those are more difficult, uh, you know, heating areas. Uh, we took a rock, walk outside the building so they could just see the grounds and kind of get a concept of where they might put uh, the wells in the ground. And we had a question and answer session afterwards. And I did ask them, you know, what they thought of the pricing that we had. Nobody really had anything to say at that point in time. But then after that meeting, uh, I got emails from a few vendors, uh, basically letting us know that the 250,000 we had was too low um, for the scope of the project. <clears throat> but they could do what's called a concept design rather than the full full blown construction plans. Um, so I didn't really want to comment on that until we heard from Eversource on if that would even be something they could use for their TA study. Um, and we actually had a meeting this morning with them. They said that uh, something like this, uh, you know, a detailed concept design would work for their needs. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, that is something that, um, as I was told by one of the vendors, it's about 50 to 60 percent of the final design, um, and it can be used for to estimate the cost of the project, which is important, uh, obviously, for us as well as to Eversource. Um, and I think the most important part was that a detailed con uh, concept design can be used to prepare the final uh, construction documents. So, um, you know, they they basically are you know more than halfway done they would take that and just continue on from that point with the uh additional detail and documents that were needed for the final construction plan um 
<coughs> excuse me, one vendor I spoke with today said um, 250,000 would cover the concept design and it would probably be about another 100,000 to complete the construction plan design work. So um, again, I, I really just had to wait until Eversource even gave that the okay before I could comment um, to the vendors on this. And obviously I wanted to bring it to your attention tonight as well. Um, there was also the concept of um, test wells. And I was asked at the walkthrough if um, test wells were included in um, the amount that we were paying them or if we were going to handle that on a separate basis. Uh, again, the original thought was that they would handle something like you know test wells because that's going to aid them in the project, but it seemed to be uh, a pretty popular question. Uh, and it seems that you know if we have numerous vendors telling us that our amount was too low and numerous vendors asking if that too low amount also includes test wells, <clears throat> which we were given an estimated cost today by Eversource of about ten dollars to $20,000. Um, it, it's just something that I, I wanted to discuss with you uh, tonight. The third aspect, and this really hasn't been discussed, but the dollar amount of projects over a three-year period um, affect the school building. It's seven um, o'clock. <laughs> Apologies. I, I, I did speak with the town building inspector. And he told me that if a building has renovations priced at more than 30% of the assessed value of the building, that building needs to be brought up to code. Obviously, in a building as old as Hopkins, there, there's a lot of code items there. So um, the building's value is currently assessed at $16 million. 30% of that will be $4.8 million in renovations. If we take the cost of the DER, which was about $3.8 million, the locker rooms was a, a thousand and six. I mean, a million and sixty nine thousand. We also had the ceiling tiles scheduled to begin in February, another hundred and sixty three thousand. We are over the four point eight million dollars. <laughs> so, I did reach out to the state. I also sent this to our attorney uh, to see if there are any exceptions to the um, to the law. I also asked the building inspector, and I ran this by the uh, the attorney as well. A good portion of the cost of this project is going to be the wells outside of the building. And because the wells are outside, I'm wondering if they would be included in the cost or not. So that might be um, a loophole. I did ask Eversource today, and they said it was an interesting question. They didn't know. Um, I asked the building inspector and he really wasn't sure either. So I'm at the state level at this point and with our attorney, I haven't heard back yet, but um, my fingers are crossed on this. I, I mean, my my thinking is it's kind of the same as if we paved the parking lot, you know, and it was expensive or something. It's really not changing the value of the building. So, um, you know, we're kind of hopeful that we'll be able to kind of find our way around that and still be able to do all the projects. But I just wanted to bring it to your attention. Chris, <laughs> comment on this. We're also, we, we have a 10 year plan underway. And uh, in year one, that project alone is gets nowhere near the 30%. In year two, that project alone doesn't get near the 30%. At what point do we start aggregating years and projects to, to try to stack it up against that 30%? You know what I'm saying? Well, it's a sliding three year period. So, you know, as, Right now, it would be, say, you know, the last two years plus this year, then moving forward, it would eliminate one year, and, and it just keeps sliding forward with the three most current years. Um, so, again, it, it's a little bit tricky with this because there are certain exemptions, which even finding the law, and I don't know if you've ever read a law, but my God, um, I mean, <laughs> I don't know if they do it on purpose or not, but reading some of these things and then reading it again and saying, I, I got something different the second time I read it. So I did send it along to the attorney. I'm sure she can read it a heck of a lot better than I can um, because it did list exemptions, but then it was only for certain things and and it was only for certain portions of the law that it would be exempt to. So, um, but, you know, I, again, details are still kind of uh, waiting to be received on that. I basically, I will do everything I can to, you know, try to make it so that we can comply with that without 
doing a full blown um, a code upgrade. The other question that I would have on it is that, uh, say, for example, with the locker rooms, um, that project will be brought up to code. So it, since that project will be bringing, you know, will be entirely up to code, will that be exempt from the total? Um, again, these are the goofy things that go through my mind when I lay down at night. So uh, basically, uh, you know, these they're all things I could be dead wrong, but I'm hoping that somebody might say, you know, that's a good thought. Um, you're right. We, we don't have to include that. So, you know, again, as I get uh, information, I can certainly keep you up to date on that. Um, you just go back to what else I have in the notes. So, um, Basically, there, there's a few things that I wanted to discuss with you tonight. Uh, the first was a discussion and, and vote on whether or not you want to go with the concept design versus the full-blown um, construction plans. <clears throat> um, there are some advantages to the concept design. The first is that it's, it's a lower initial cost than the full construction documents. So if we were to do just the concept design we would we wouldn't be paying the full amount because it, it seems unlikely that we're going to get these uh full documents for the amount that we put in the uh in the specs if we find out for example after the ta study is done that this is not going to be a 3.8 million dollar project and it's actually going to be you know, i'm just making up a number but a 5.8 million dollar project or something like that and or if the TA study comes back and says, you know, now that we did the deeper dive on this, your savings are going to be considerably less. At least we haven't spent all the money on the full construction documents and we could stop right there, you know, if it wasn't going to work. Um, the other aspect is, of course, it can be utilized as part of the full construction documents. So we would be, you know, 50 to 60 percent done at that point. And I think the biggest one of all is that, I, I mean, I know one one vendor just said they weren't even going to uh, submit because of the pricing limitations. They said it just isn't enough. We're not going to submit. And so I think if we if we change it to a concept design, we would get more RFQ submissions um, with, with you know with the pricing that we included in there than if we uh, left it with the full blown plans. So that was the first one. Kind of piggybacking off of that is, as part of combines, which I needed to list this project on, um, I needed to list an approximate price. So, I mean, there's no way around it. You have to list it. And, you know, we were told that an average fee for design work would be 6 to 7%. Um, the project was $3.8 million. So I took 6.5% of that, which is a little less than 250000 thinking, okay. You know, we're, we're in the ballpark. It seems, uh, and Eversource told us this today, that because this is just not your typical project, I mean, there's there's just different curveballs that can be thrown at a designer. You know, they they drill a wall and hit asbestos, or, or you know, or the 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 wells uh, you know have very difficult to drill through bedrock or something underground. Um, all of that could could sway the. Uh, the prices either way. And so I think that's why they're a little bit nervous about the price that we have listed. So, you know, it's those two items together. Um, I'm, I'm really open to discussion on this from you, your opinions, your thoughts, uh, to see how best to move forward with it. Um, we also have a test well question as well, but I, that's kind of separate than this. So, um, you know, just any, any thoughts or comments you have, we would appreciate them. Thank you, Chris. Uh, questions for Chris. Right, I'll say I'm okay if we go to conceptual design, if Eversource is okay with it. Um, I would leave in the test well and maybe make it an optional just because I'd, I'd want their assessment of the potential costs of that. Right? Otherwise we'd have to rebid a test well separately or, or pay for that. Hmm. We'd, I mean, so we'd, we'd have to get three quotes for that. Yeah. So can you put it as an optional task and see what these, because would these folks do the that as well? 
Um, Eversource uh, would like a test well done. You know, it makes their TA study a little bit better. It it certainly helps in terms of um, the design aspect as well, because, uh, and you know, again, this is all kind of new to us, but in, in speaking with various people throughout the day, you may end up where we need to drill a thousand feet down. But if we drill deeper, we might need less wells than if we drilled you know, less deep. So there's a lot of aspects um, to consider and a test well would be important to have, whether or not we pay for it or the designer pays for it um, is a different story. There's two benefits to that. I mean, if we pay for it, the designer is not going to tack on their overhead and profit um, to the cost. So it's going to save us a couple thousand dollars there. Um, if the designer does it, it might be something where we would have to add that to what we pay them, you know, keep it as a separate item um, and just say, okay, you know, bill us for the test drill and we will pay it. Um, so it, it, it's really, it, it's it's up to you guys how you would like to handle that. But I, I think it is important to have a test well drilled. Yeah, no, I agree. I'm just questioning just from a logistical procedural standpoint, can we just ask them to bid it out as an optional task? And so we have their cost assessment. We can then determine whether we want to bid it out ourselves. Um, and you're saying even if we go down to just conceptual design, the 50 to 60% specs, that is still going to be pushing up to the 250? That's what I was told, yeah. Um, I mean, if you're willing, if you can amend the RFP now, I would add in the wells just to get a sense of that. And, and then if you think we can go out on our own and, and do that separate process, I just think it's always easier to have one contractor than manage multiple subs or something. Oh, no doubt. Yeah, there's, there's no doubt about that. Yeah. It might, I mean, you know, and I, I'm not trying to get out of doing it by any means, but it might be quicker Yeah. if the contractor does it just because of the fact that I have to get three quotes for that. Right. They won't have to. So yeah. it's a little bit speedier as far as that goes. I mean, and I, I, would I, just, leave in the, I would leave in the cost. I wouldn't make it price negotiable. Don't another, you think, Chris? I mean... Can we do this? Can, can we do it so that you we we uh, imagine we approved the full amount, but after the conceptual, there was a go no go decision. And if we if we if it, if it was go, then the same entity would go the the full amount. So so this way we're not doing two rounds of RFPs and we're not having a vendor that's coming back and jacking up the rate. Well, yeah, I mean, absolutely. There's there's a, a big benefit to that because it would be hard to find a designer that would take somebody else's work and then right. say, oh, sure, we'll take this, assume it's all right and just move forward. You know, they're gonna wanna start from scratch. So and we the first would have one to has, write- First one has this by the ball. The first one has this by the ball. <laughs> If we don't if we don't lock in the rate and the the plan, but if we do it in a tranched way, like a you know phase one and phase two, mm -hmm. uh, sure. Yeah, and no, I, I think that makes all, perfect sense. Building in the well, it, it just it's going to make things a lot easier. They get their own people. They get their their answers quickly from their own people, um, and it keeps you from having to do three three bids. So I I okay. I do love that. Choice and so I just want to make sure we're clear on that. Would we pay the designer the extra for the test well, or that would be absorbed by their fee that they're getting? You know, would they bill us extra for it, or? I don't know. So you're, you're, are you saying that they have to keep it under a 250 cap if we put 250? No. Uh, well, I mean, as the as it says right now, it's a two hundred fifty thousand dollar limit, which I was told they can do the concept plan for that. You know, many vendors, I would say four or five of them asked about the test drilling and if we were going to pay for that separately or if that was included. You know, we can certainly leave it in and just say, well, you know, we we just gave we, we tossed you the bone of, of, you know, just doing the concept plan. You eat the cost of the uh, test drill. I mean, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it's not a huge amount. So we can certainly try that. So I want to clarify. We're saying if we did do the the whole thing, but in in a, in phases, 
then we would be putting an upper limit at 350 after which uh and and asking them to cover the cost of the wells itself so now there's a larger amount and it's sort of all inclusive but we're asking them to first give us the concept design with the test wells and that will that'll authorize 250 thousand of spending to accomplish that. We have all the data we need for Eversource to commit to, yes, you will be getting all of the incentives that we outlined, which gives us the assurance that our, our rebates from Eversource and our rebates from the federal government will be what they, what we think they will be. We will have that certainty. And if, if they come back with data that says it won't be that, and we have different numbers and we wanna back away from this project, then we're out 250,000. But if we- That is correct. But if we do wanna, we, we like what we see, we're, we the incentives line up, then we just simply pay another $100,000 to get the full engineering design. And then we can start the project by select a vendor, start the project. Now, and again, I, I, I just have to say this, it's not like they said yes, two hundred fifty thousand plus a hundred thousand. You know, she she tossed that out as, you know, I would say we could do this for the two hundred fifty thousand, and it'd be about another hundred thousand for that. So, you know, I mean, if, if the price came in at three fifty five or something total, or three forty five, you know, I just I want you to be aware that it wasn't like that was a formal submission that they that I was given. It was just a, this is you know this is what we can do. And so, Chris, we have the ability now to amend the RFP that significantly to add in a big separate task or two. The we wells. Can. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I did extend um, a little further down in the document. I extended the bid opening from tomorrow uh, until February sixth because I wanted to get, um, you know, your thoughts on how to move forward with this. So we have another couple of weeks. I scheduled another walkthrough on Wednesday um, because, you know, with the extension. There were some people that missed the initial walkthrough, so I scheduled another one for Wednesday morning so they can come and check the building out as well. Again, hoping to get as many submissions as we can. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, and then, so then if that's the case, I, I think Kim here's got a good point, right? Let's let's put it all into one RFP, mm -hmm. the, whatever it's, it's the 50 to 60%, and then that's the concept design, and then to the construction plans, I guess it sounds like. And I don't know what percentage of completion that gets you this for the specs and then the well but it i mean humera is right right you just do it in staged authorizations where you only authorize this and then you know however we word it that you know you don't proceed to that second task unless you're authorized right yeah okay i do think we'll get a much better we'll get better bids better quotes that way overall and the the it engineering well, it's really great that we have a lot of interest. That's really positive. Yeah. And I think the the selection of the engineering design firm is really going to be key in like placement and like the the uh, the systems that are used. And and there are I know there are some firms that have done this before. It's not new to them. And you know we want I think because we are new in this, it would behoove us to have a firm that had more experience. And hopefully, we're able to make that budget happen i mean i mean chris who's advising us on the tax credit situation is that ever source um oh, that might have been from sarah ross yeah, and sarah no, but we don't have a consultant now a paid consultant who's professional that's advising us on this um, not she's not a paid no no i know sarah i'm saying we don't so have a separate no, we don't. And I, I would just lay out this time, like, so that might help you think about when that makes the most sense. So right now you take these, as you said, your staged authorizations. Your detailed conceptual design, you provide that to Eversource. With that, Eversource can then do their technical assistance document, which will tell you the likely incentives that you would receive from Eversource. And um, they may speak only to Eversource. But at that point, at the same time, We'll also use that information to get general, not a full bid, but general cost estimates because Eversource has said, it'd be really helpful if you took that detailed conceptual analysis, got some project cost estimates that we could then incorporate into our TA study for you. At that 
point when they're working on their TA, if we were looking for additional assistance with IRA, with federal incentives, it may make sense at that point to do that just in, in terms of timing um, to then get that. And also one thing that was brought to our attention today is that unanticipated cost escalation. So the example that they gave was, let's say you have to completely redo the electricity to carry the load. Then the incentives from Eversource do not increase um, with cost project escalation. They may from the federal government, but to your point, we would need somebody at that point in time to probably help us do that assessment. And also Eversource won't cover any cost for this part, like the designs, there's no reimbursement or incentive for that. It may or may not be covered with the federal government. So I, I think you make an excellent point. We need somebody to help us and advise us. We don't have that person now. It could be as we move into TA because then the school committee can make a more informed decision, right? Of here's the incentives we think that we're eligible for and here are the projected total project cost. And I am saying school committee because it starts with the school committee. However, the reality as we all know is this is, has to be done with the approval ultimately of the town. Because the town, you know, school committee doesn't have this money. That's helpful. Thanks, Annie. Okay, so uh, in light of uh, in light of this, I'm I'm supportive that we increase the the cost. We what we really want to get to is data about uh, and assurances on the incentives. So getting that conceptual plan with drilling data is really key for Eversource to 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 give us that information. And uh, so the fact that we can modify what you've already started and that we can take these leads that are hot and wanting to, to do the work for us uh, and, and get a potential quote from them, I think we should move to uh, increase that, uh, that, that cost and, and make sure to build in those phases. Okay. Sounds good. Is this something that requires a vote? I honestly mm. not really sure. Annie, you're on mute. Um, if you're clear about all the adjustments that you're making, I would uh, state them one more time aloud exactly what you're doing. Somebody can move what you pre present and second it. Let's just make sure it's recorded exactly what all the school committee is. And you're you're saying uh, you're asking Chris to repeat it, or yeah, yeah. So he doesn't understand. Unless you want to say it, that's fine. But as long as somebody has a clear understanding, I think that's helpful. I welcome Chris to say it. Okay, um, so we will amend the RFQ to uh, to build it build it in phases with the first two hundred and fifty thousand going to the detailed concept design. And an additional one hundred thousand for the finished construction documents. If approved. Where's the test well? With the test well to be covered by the detailed concept design phase. Yes. Right. Test well covered in detailed concept phase and it's covered by the designer by the designer but yep. by the engineer term yep. do i hear a so okay. move so moved and do i hear a second seconded all in favor aye aye Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Chris, for taking us through that. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Okay, uh, no problem. And I have um, an update on the locker room project as well. Um, it's just on the next page of that report. So this went live last week. Um, as of today, I have nine um, requests for the project specs. So I didn't send any out yet because 
I did have a meeting um, with our athletic director and our gym teacher at Hopkins, uh, just with the plans. We laid them out on a table. We looked at the plans that were done in 2009 and they both just uh, agreed that, wow, these plans are not what we want in the locker room. Um, so, okay, uh, that meant another curveball thrown in these projects. Um, so I did reach out to uh, someone that we've used in the past, uh, you know, that does this kind of stuff. And I just asked for, um, I asked a few things. Number one, I asked if somebody would take the existing plans and just kind of retrofit it after meeting with us to say, oh, we don't want this many showers in our new locker room. We have no need for them. We're going to replace that space with something else. And he said, well, you'd really have a hard time finding a designer that would be willing to do that. Um, kind of, again, the same the same thing with the DER project of nobody's just going to assume that all the plans are correct. They might as well start from scratch if they're going to check them all, you know? So he gave me an estimate of seventy five dollars to $100,000 um, for the cost of the plans for the locker room. Um, so I did post it everywhere. Um, you know, I can always pull it. I can just alert the people that, you know, um, we're not going to do this right now. But, <clears throat> excuse me, I, again, wanted to run it by you. Um, you know, looking at the plans, there's a number of things. There's there's even some, some current code items that were not included in the 2009 plan. So we'd certainly want to make sure that whatever work we did was compliant with today's codes. Um, so uh, again, I'm open to questions or discussion on this, but the plans that we have that that we've you know had for years just are not what you know what's wanted in a locker room. It's actually in some cases kind of excessive, you know. And what I'm hoping is that um, you know some of the savings we receive will will certainly keep this project right on budget because you know the number of showers, for example, I mean that's a lot of. It's a lot of plumbing work. It's a lot of cutting into the floors for drains. I mean, there's a lot of work installing showers. And really, kids don't use showers in a locker room like no. they used to. You know, I mean, they, they hop in the car and go home after a game. And uh, I guess we're, you know, we're supposed to have a couple. I guess the refs sometimes like to shower after a game before they go home. So they might use it. I, I wasn't even aware of that. But um, Eric and Fred both mentioned that that was the case. So. Did anyone um, mention an access from the gym into the girls' locker room and not having to go out and around? Yes, actually. I mean, we, we walk through, we have a whole list of of things that we want um, in the locker rooms that, and, you know, basically what we would do, um, what I put in the specs is that, you know, the designer would first meet with us, see exactly what we want, and go from there uh, rather than, you know, using the existing plans. But again, you know, this is the school committee's decision. I'm just kind of letting you know where we stand with this project so far. I have a question. Um, especially given the fact that we won't need as many showers, there won't need to be concrete cutting, uh, no no additional plumbing. It, it, it seems, uh, what I'm hearing so far is cost removal, cost removal. I'm wondering if uh, we can build into the part of the bid that the uh, construction firm that's selected will be working with us to do the designs. So, so basically we just, it's a, make it an all in one uh, bid and they're starting from scratch. They're not using designs that we have. I honestly don't know if, if there are construction firms that do the whole thing from soup to nuts. Um, I can certainly reach out to some and ask, but I don't know if that's something they do or they work or, with their they work with their subcontractors to do the the design. Yeah, that's that's my guess, but again, I because our upper floor, so. our upper limit is is higher than what the project necessitates in light of the fact that we're removing all of this cost. Yeah, I can see. Um I also want to ask. I I just want to ask a question, Tamara. I'm not sure if this would be an issue, but I want to throw it out there. The vote at town meeting floor is for the construction of the locker rooms. We fold in the plans at the same time. I don't want to run afoul of what was authorized. We definitely want to make sure we check with the board. Do you see what I'm saying? So what would happen if the money, if it costs less, is that money 
the town would simply borrow less money. Do you see what I'm saying? That the plans weren't folded in. So we had plans to use school choice while we thought our plans would be sufficient. So we didn't even say we were using school choice. We thought the plans would be sufficient. Um, and so we didn't, I just want to check the, what was voted on. So I just want to put that out there before and say it to Chris too. I want to make sure that we were even, even if the, the cost of the engineer, uh, if the construction cost came down, but there was an engineering cost that was unanticipated, we could still cover the engineering cost with our school choice monies and the balance with the town. So that's accounting on our end. But the point is that we're leading with an RFP. We're already out there. There are nine firms. If if half of them also regularly design, either, either through partners or in-house, then we could make a selection and get started right away. And whatever bucket money comes, you know, we could we could be copacetic with that when the time comes to pay the check. But at least we're getting out of the gate and getting started with the project. And so if a construction firm cannot do both, then what do we do? Then I think we are, uh, we're, we're probably going to need to get a, an engineering design firm. It'll probably, it, it may or may not be in time for this summer. We're probably, we're, you know, we're, everything gets pushed forward. One RFP for engineering design firm, another for construction. We're not gonna select the construction out of the nine. Everything gets pushed forward. Is, is, is as far as I can see, uh, does someone else see it differently? Okay, so I guess so. What I'm hearing is that you want you want to look for a design firm that also is a general contractor, and then if we don't get any response, then we push the whole project back because we have to then go out to bid for a design firm and a separate contractor. Is that what? Am I? Yeah. I'm just. Looking, these contractors, whether or not they have in-house design abilities or they partner with other design firms, we're, we're, we're working through the construction firm to be the general contractor for all of it. And that is that that is a question. If not- Have you ever used anyone like that? I'm, I'm asking, for, I, I don't know. Have we ever used it's anyone a, like that? It's a design build company. I'm sure there's- And they exist, sure. So, and if not, then you're coming back, Chris, next month and asking us for funding to do designs. And and we're looking at pushing this out a year. Maybe that in involves telling the town as well that we, I don't know if that we have to get an extension on the monies, but I don't see any way around it. Do Is there an alternate scenario that I'm? Um, I guess the only alternate scenario to, again, to keep things moving would be if I could reach out to um, construction firms and just see, you know, reach out to a number of them and see, hey, you guys do this or do you have everyone, you know, just bring you the designs or, you know, is an outside firm doing it? And if they don't, then I can go, you know, to, to you know, we need to get separate plans done. Right. That, that to me is the best case scenario mm -hmm. is to to see if one of our nine can do it in-house or even outsource it, but general contract the design and construction. That keeps our momentum going. Otherwise, you're coming back and asking us for seeking new engineering firm bids. Right. So we can cross our fingers and, and wait and see if the RFP that you modify gets us there. I'm texting my father as we speak too because he was a general contractor um, for large scale buildings. So um, just checking with him, he might be able to give me a quick answer. But uh, so, okay, um, I will certainly reach out and, uh, you know, see what I can come up with. But so, uh, you know, if if they can, that's great. If they can't, do you want me to tell you at the next meeting or, or you know? Yes, tell us at the next meeting and then we'll move okay. forward with with that next step but will that push us back or no yeah 
Of course, yeah. of course, of course it will. It, yeah, the best case scenario is that the partner that we pick is able to get this more simplified design done, which I don't see any reason why at least a few of the nine wouldn't be able to, but we'll find out. Sounds good. And so just one one other update, it's not on this list, but as a result of all of this going on, we were going to have the ceiling tiles replaced with the suspended ceilings um, during February vacation and again during April vacation. Um, unfortunately, this was one of those things that hit me this morning. We were going to have a very small amount of space between the existing ceiling and the suspended because of the windows that go all the way to the top of the classroom walls. And, you know, if you lower the suspended ceiling, obviously you're gonna have to build something to slant up so that it meets the top of the windows. It's a little more complicated. Um, and then it occurred to me that if we do the DER project, we're going to have ductwork and piping, uh, you know, above the suspended ceiling. And what a disaster that would be to try to set all that up with the grids in place versus, waiting, you know, until we had the duct work in and then building the suspended ceiling around that. So I, just in case you were wondering what's going on with that suspended ceiling project, um, we had somebody lined up to do that. I'm going to just ask them if they can hold off. And uh, of course they can, you know, we haven't exactly um, signed a contract or anything, but it's just the right thing to do. Otherwise we're going to end up really making a mess of the work they did, you know, to get the duct work and the piping in. So. Makes a um, lot of sense. We're going to suspend yeah. the suspended ceiling. <laughs> yes, that All is right. correct. Yeah. We're sense. not going to drop a drop ceiling. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Gotta love the oh, you guys are You guys are good. <laughs> well, you right. started it, tired. actually. Come on, come on. <laughs> um, let's see. And, and that's all I have. I don't know if there are any other questions. I do have the, the uh, financial reports as well, but I just wanted to jump on these things first. I don't think there are any other questions on this. <clears throat> Let's nope. move into the uh, the three documents. Thanks okay, for all your so work, Chris. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so the first one is the expense report from the general budget. Um, basically, uh, you know, if you look at the last page, there are there are some accounts that are far under budget, some that are over budget. A lot of the ones that are considerably over budget are a result of again we have. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, some of the sped tuitions where we need to move the uh, expenses over to circuit breaker and the 240 grant. So they're just artificially high. Um, but we're at $3.7 million as of um, last Thursday remaining in the year and um, a considerable amount of grant funds yet to be, you know, uh, charged for a number of these expenses. So, you know, we're in really good shape as far as that goes. Um, the percent used overall is 52% of the budget, pretty much right in line with where we are in the year. So, um, you know, that's that's definitely a good thing. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions on the expense report. No questions. Okay, then the next one on the list is the revolving accounts report. Um, just a couple of items to, <clears throat> excuse me, to let you know on these. Uh, the athletic revolving, it will start to increase. We did get the uh, proceeds, the, the gate receipts from basketball. And they were pretty decent amounts too, but I was on vacation the last week of the year, so they didn't get deposited until January. So uh, they will show up in the January balances along with any others that come in during that time. Um, that's basically um, really all I have to report on them. Again, I mean, lunch... We're missing the December revenues and uh, I, I, they came in in January. So uh, we'll be a little behind with that, but um, the rest of the uh, accounts look good. Um, I can answer any questions you might have on these as well. Anyone have questions for Chris? Okay, and onward to grants. Okay, so this is the first grants report that you've gotten this year. Um, you know, again, with the late approval of a lot of grants, we just didn't have all of them approved, certainly not a lot of expenses charged to them. Um, but I did a number of expense transfers to them. I mean, obviously a lot more to go, but um, you can see where we stand. These are all the grants. Uh, again, I mean, the number of grants that we get is is outstanding. You know, it used to be one page, maybe half full, and it was landscape. 
now it's a full page portrait. So, I mean, it's really, there's a lot of grants there and, and a good amount of money uh, that we have coming in to supplement the budget. Um, but as you can see, there's a, a little over $700,000 in grant funds yet to be expended. Some of that is from ESSER 3 and will be used to pay for um, a good portion of the um, DER design work. Um, but nevertheless, there's still a considerable amount that will be charged um, to existing expenses or future ones. So um, I can, you know, going forward, obviously, I'll be able to update this every month now. Great. Any questions uh, for Chris? Ooh. Chris, did you want to add something to that? No, I was just going to ask the same thing if there were any questions. All right. No questions. Chris, thank you so much. Uh, and by the way, I, I really like it better as a, a portrait. It, it, it just, yeah, gives us more space to work with. Okay. <laughs> Great. Thank you. All right. Um, we are going to um, move into the final stretch. Uh, we do not have student representative updates um, and we're moving into action items. Do I hear a motion uh, to- you, I'm sorry, did you, did, what they sent to you because they're not linked here. Did Peg send them to you directly? But they were not Otherwise, sent, so we're not okay. moving. Okay, so them. my, yeah, I'll, I'll bring December and January to February. You don't okay. have to do it. We've already uh, voted on B and C. School committee updates, uh, Tara, Playground and CES. Um, so CES, we have a meeting on the 31st. So I will report back in February um, on that. Playground, <laughs> I'll be providing um, some documents for the February meeting as well for you guys to review um, on some things that we've been working on to start donor solicitations. Excellent. Thank you. Um, on the finance front, there was a finance meeting that took place in uh, December. Um, I can't remember if I already reported out to you all that uh, uh, there's really nothing to report. Things are moving forward. Um, and there will be a tri-board meeting again. Um, not sure when, but when there is, I will let you know about it. Fields, Paul. Shout out to Fred Siaglo, the athletic director, and Chris uh, on the call here. Um, you know, weather obviously uh, stymied continued progress right now, but they're getting things ready. So when the weather opens up, we can start moving. Uh, one backstop is done, well is in, which is good news. And then they're ordering the scoreboards and bleachers now and uh, meeting with Amasta to talk about um, where we've had credits and where we've had new charges just to balance out the, the budget. So. Chris, anything to add? You've been doing a great job working with Fred on that. No, um, basically uh, that's about it. We we had a meeting scheduled for last Wednesday, but Omasta wasn't able to get the supporting detail for the credits and the new charges. Um, so we're just, we moved the meeting off to this week so that they could have all that information for us. Um, after that, nothing else to report. We, we have asked that, you know, weather permitting over the winter, um, that we keep whatever we can do moving. I mean, it's not typical that you're doing this kind of work in the winter, but you know, they can install a backstop. I mean, something like that, you know, can be done. The screens can be put up. Um, some work they were waiting until the ground froze. So again, you know, that's that's work that can be done. And anything we get done now means it won't be, you know, getting done in April or something. So we'll keep plugging away at it. Thanks. Thank you, Paul and Chris. Moving on to capital and negotiations, Christine. So we did have a meeting on the 16th uh, and we did present an offer and we will let you know how they respond uh, at the next meeting. Great, thank you. Um, and at the next meeting, I'm assuming we will likely have an executive session to discuss that? Yes. Okay, very good. Thank you. Moving on to policy, Ethan. Yes, so I do want to turn everybody's attention to the link in the agenda that will take you to the uh, policy subcommittee agenda. Uh, and Annie, help me out with this. Uh, I believe what we'd like you to look at is the revised, uh, it's highlighted the revised JKAA uh, um, policy from the attorney. This is on uh, physical restraint of students. Um, it is going to replace the, the current policy that we have in place 
uh, that we did in 2014. This is a much more detailed policy. And, and I think we're asking you all to look at it in the hopes that we can bring it for a, Annie, am I right? First and final reading yes. next. Is this, yeah, it's next, next, month. next month, correct. Because this is also part of DESE requirements. Yes. This is part of the special education audit. So these changes, but it is a lot to read. So it's tossing out the current wholesale revised. We'd like to try to do a first and final in six. So isn't this month considered the first reading? No, well, I didn't I didn't bring it to you in advance. Policy, I just got it back from the attorney. Policy subcommittee just saw it. I see. So that's why we're calling your attention to the policy subcommittee agenda so you can read those revised restraint ones. Very good. Thank you. Right. So you you've got uh, the new policy and then uh, a a form that's been uh, cultivated that also you guys should look at as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. We'll take a look. All right. Anything else to report on policy? Uh, so then we're taking a look at some of our homeschooling policies. That's that's uh, the bulk of what we did this this month or on the, uh, at four thirty. All right. Terrific. Thank you. Look forward to that as well. We are not going into executive session, and uh, we are discussing next meeting dates. So uh, let's see. Oh, that should be there, right? It should be. No, it says it says January twenty second. Well, that's not helpful. Next I'm meeting sorry. days. Oh, that's my Zoom invitation. So the next meeting in February would be the fourth uh, Monday is February twenty sixth. Twenty sixth. That's right. And uh, Terrific. I'm hitting yes on that. I think you already sent a, an invite. All right. Um, thank you, everyone. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Do I hear a second? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.